This series from The Conversation is supported by the National Centre for Social Research, NATSEN, the largest independent and not-for-profit social research organisation in the UK. It's been a very long time waiting for this moment, and all I can tell you is that I am deeply proud and privileged to stand before you as the new Labour Prime Minister of this country. That is, of course, Tony Blair, one of the most divisive politicians in 20th century British politics. And the New Deal, the biggest ever programme for unemployment, introduced by a Labour government. And what do people like you say? Because it's not perfect, you've done nothing and therefore I'm walking away from it. It's perfect. He was both one of the most popular Prime Ministers in British history and one of the most unpopular. Forget the past. No more bosses versus workers. We are on the same side, the same team, and Britain United will win. It is said that when Blair took over the Labour Party, he abandoned the working class. There was a very deliberate move on the part of Tony Blair after 1997 to pitch the party um, towards being a party for the middle class as well as the working class. This is Tim Bale. He's Professor of Politics at Queen Mary, University of London. There was a degree to which that, I think, sent a signal to working class people that this wasn't their party anymore. I also think, actually, you see after 1997 a kind of confirmation of uh, a trend in the Labour Party away from having MPs who have much obvious connection with the working class, albeit people who come maybe from a kind of working class background originally, but they look and sound very different to ordinary working class people. So I think, you know, working class alienation has gone in stages, but I think you saw it accelerate under the Blair Brown governments. Obviously, it was an electoral calculation to move towards the middle classes. But do you think the intention was to attempt to build a coalition of working class and middle class voters and there was just complacency? Or did you, do you think that it was more of an active decision to, to leave the working class voter behind? Well, I mean, I think there's a degree to which Blair and those advising him thought rationally about this issue. They looked at the fact that you know the working class was shrinking, at least in objective terms, and therefore the Labour Party couldn't possibly hope to put together a winning electoral coalition based purely on working class voters it as it perhaps might have done in the past. But I think also, yes, there there was a degree to which they hoped they could build a cross-class coalition. But in order to do that, perhaps, they spent more time rhetorically appealing to, to the middle class folks and thought the working class vote would look after itself as long as they got the economy and public services right. You may have heard the phrase, we're all middle class now. In the mid-90s, Blair began talking of his vision of a new middle class, one that included people who traditionally saw themselves as working class. And in government, his priorities were social mobility and meritocracy. For the Labour Party, there is pre-Blair and post-Blair. So what makes his decision to move away from working class voters such a watershed moment? I'm Laura Hood, Senior Politics Editor at The Conversation UK. And today on Know Your Place, What Happened to Class in British Politics, we're going back to the beginning. The clue is in the name, really, isn't it? The Labour Party. The Labour Party was set up explicitly to be a party for working people. That's Mark Garnett, a senior lecturer in politics at Lancaster University. He's written extensively about both Labour and the Conservatives over the years. If Labour is doing its job description, then it should be the party of the working class. The Labour Party was created in 1900 by trade unionists who wanted to give a voice to working class people. It's the Edwardian era in Britain. Carriages and early automobiles are sharing the streets. You aren't fully dressed without a hat of some kind. The Industrial Revolution has changed Britain into a land of factories and production. At the time, the class structure was rigid. Only property-owning men could vote. In other words, the wealthy. 
The First World War provided impetus for change, laying bare the hypocrisy of expecting millions of men to fight and die for a country that didn't even allow them a say in its elections. It's also the advent of universal adult suffrage and manhood suffrage in 1918 and uh, universal suffrage in the following decade. In that situation, the newly enfranchised working class were numerically dominant. And so there was a, a feeling, certainly amongst the opponents of the Labour Party, that the Labour Party was bound in time to become the biggest electoral force. It had the largest number of people on the ground, as it were. In the early days, Labour was a flourishing movement, not just a choice at the ballot box. Certainly, when we get to the middle part of the 20th century, being a supporter of the Labour Party was something that one inherited almost. It would certainly be very peculiar if you were a very conscious member of the working class who didn't also see yourself as a Labour Party supporter. So it's almost a tribal inherited allegiance for working class people with the Labour Party. And by the same token, it became much more tribal, the feeling that if you were not a member of the working class, you were likely to ally yourself on a consistent basis with the Conservative Party. So in other words, these are allegiances which are not temporary. They are lifelong allegiances. What about the Conservative Party? Now, the Conservative Party had really been the party of the aristocracy and it was uncomfortable about the idea of democracy for obvious reasons. It looked like it was destined to always lose. And that meant the Conservative Party had to redesign itself. It could no longer really be associated much with the aristocracy. There weren't enough votes in being the party of the aristocracy. And so it had to reach out and broaden its appeal. And clearly it was always in a best position to broaden its appeal towards the middle classes. And what does uh, the offering to the middle classes look like when the Conservatives decide to do that? The Conservative Party, as it redesigned itself adopted what was called a one nation position. It was an approach to politics, which at least on paper looked like the Conservative Party was really trying to appeal to everyone, working class as well as middle class and what was left of the aristocracy. But in practice, that meant the Conservative Party really concentrated on satisfying the perceived interests of members of the property-owning classes. Now, quite clearly at that time, that was meant to appeal to either members of the middle class or members of the working class who wanted to leave behind the working class. And that meant that there was a kind of antagonism between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, which reflected what were at the time very strong class divisions. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. As the Second World War came to an end in 1945, life changed immensely. And another landmark moment in British politics occurred. The election of the first majority Labour government, led by Clement Attlee. I am talking to you today because I want to ask you all to help in making this country of ours more prosperous. Producer Gemma and I headed off to South London to meet up with Reg Race, a former Labour MP. Hi, Reg. Hello. Gemma and Laura. Yes, that is, right. that is So us. which way round is it? I'm Laura. You're Laura, the I'm tall Jeff. one, and Jeff is the one. <laughs> oh, don't give me a compliment. All the equipment. <laughs> That's right. Exactly, exactly. She's coming out from the road. Thank you very much. Good to meet you. Reg came from a working class background in Salford and Manchester. In 1979, he became the Labour MP for Wood Green, a London constituency next to the one in which I grew up. Reg is no longer in Parliament, but has remained heavily engaged in Labour politics. His experiences led him to write a book about the party's relationship with the working class. His other claim to fame 
is as the first MP to say the F word in the House of Commons chamber. Order! 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 Reg told me that the 1945 election of Clement Attlee still holds a mythical place within the Labour movement. Many people take that as a benchmark at the time when Labour was most connected to the working class, and I tend to agree with that. I, uh, there was a very large contingent of working class MPs in the PLP. That's the Parliamentary Labour Party, or all the Labour MPs. Which was a very important ballast, which meant that the party leadership, if it had wanted to, couldn't move away quickly from working class interests. The legislation put forward in the 45 government was famously linked to the manifesto and uh, there were huge strides forward as far as the NHS was concerned, the creation in 1948, social security itself, codifying and deepening the existing social arrangements that existed and a mass house building programme which really started under the Attlee government and really flowered in the 1950s and 60s. We were building something like a quarter of a million public houses a year. I don't mean pubs, I mean social housing. Um, and it made the most enormous difference to the people's condition. I mean, people who got pre even prefabs in the Attlee government thought they were living in palaces. I mean, they really did. It was a transformation of their lives. With all this, class voting was cemented. The most dramatic illustration of class I can give you is in the 1951 general election. Martin Farr is a senior lecturer in contemporary British history at Newcastle University. 98% of voters voted Conservative or Labour. No other parties mattered. You were either Conservative or Labour, depending on the colour of your collar, blue or white collar. And you voted the same as your parents, and if you're a woman, you voted the same as your husband. In terms of class, the 50s is still very very ossified. There are still the debutante seasons, for instance. There's still, in cricket, there's still the gentlemen and players, depending on where your initials are. It's still very stratified. And the rigidity of the class system was mirrored in Parliament itself. It's quite revealing to look at the typical Conservative and typical Labour MP for much of the first half of the 20th century, and indeed going on into the 1960s. The Conservatives have many more former soldiers, the honourable and gallant gentlemen, as they're referred to in parliamentary language. Lots of landowners, lots of people from the city, lots of financiers, uh, lots of people who are, who are baronets, so they inherit the title sir from their father, most of whom went to public school, or if not to Sandhurst, and uh, are members of the clubs, the gentlemen's clubs of Pall Mall. And so it's a very, very homogenous makeup. Labour MPs, by contrast, almost exclusively trades unionists, sponsored by their unions to go into Parliament. Throughout the 20th century, the unions brought working class communities together as a political force and acted as the link between the Labour movement and the Labour Party in Parliament. Unions negotiated for working class interests, organised collective political action and even nurtured activists into careers as Labour politicians. But during the economic and political turbulence of the 1970s, tensions began to emerge between the unions and government. And to the trade union leaders, I would say this. Stop the strikes and start the work. Conservative Prime Minister Edward Heath battled the unions during lengthy strikes. 1970s arguably is the death of everything we've been describing so far about Labour Party in Britain. The Conservatives would say, this is, this is what we warned you about at the beginning. This is the ultimate expression of what happens when trade unions become not merely part of industry, but start to dominate industry. That trade unions can determine who is in government would be the point they would make. And they would cite the experience of the Heath government in 1974 as being an example of that. And heightened by the fact that Heath actually asks who governs us, the elected government, or the trade unions. And so this becomes a wonderful moment for the Conservative Party because they cited it thereafter, and they still do 50 years later, as what happens when Labour take power. If you like this podcast, why not listen to What's Wrong With Democracy, a new weekly podcast from Tortoise Media in partnership with Open Society Foundations. 
Join political scientist Ben Ansell and guests from the world of politics as they explore the issues affecting democracies both near and far, and whether our fractured body politic can be put back together. Search for What's Wrong With Democracy wherever you listen to your podcasts and follow the feed to make sure you don't miss an episode. By the end of the 1970s, tensions between the unions and politicians were building and building, and it opened the path for the most legendary union hater of all time. How do you feel at this moment? Very excited, very aware of the responsibilities. Her Majesty, the Queen, has asked me to form a new administration, and I have accepted. Enter Margaret Thatcher who became Prime Minister in 1979, following the legendary Winter of Discontent. There are empty beds up on Bland Sutton Ward because the hospital stopped all but emergency admissions last Thursday. In London, untreated rubbish accumulates. The dangers of disease are evident. During the Labour government of James Callaghan, widespread industrial action had left rubbish piled high in the streets and essential public services unable to function. The Thatcherite narrative of this period has become the dominant narrative. People think of this as being the end of of a period in our history where Britain becomes ungovernable because trade unions are too powerful. And there's a restart or a resetting that takes place in 79. And thereafter, the country is more economically efficient and the trade unions are put back in their box. Now, not everyone holds that view, but it's striking how much that is a kind of unthinking response that the year zero is 79. When Thatcher's turn came to take on the strikers, she was prepared. Unions took industrial action to try to prevent the closure of some of the country's last remaining coal mines. These mines often lay at the heart of working class communities, providing jobs for local families. As the strikes went on, we saw more and more violent clashes with the police. But Thatcher pushed on with these closures anyway. As far as we are concerned, we shall do all in our power to resist this closure programme. And we would urge all our members to continue to support union policy, to defend their pit and their jobs. That's Arthur Scargill, the legendary union leader, rallying the troops against Thatcher in 1984. The lack of political will to replace what was lost in these industrial communities will become a defining feature of British politics thereafter. What were once thriving areas were allowed to decline and the miners suffer enormous deprivation. Groups go back to work slowly, and the thing thing crumbles. It took a year. It was a brutal, a brutal conflict. But it was one which saw the restatement, as she would see it, of the authority of the state. And she would say the state as being constituted by the government elected by a general election. Who elected Arthur Scargill? Who elected the miners to dominate? That's her view, of course. In more general terms, of course, this is part of a much greater, what we would call neoliberal project to weaken organised labour, to make labour cheaper, to empower and embolden employers and financial capital. So it's it's too far to say it's a reversal, but certainly it's it's an attempt to reset what she thinks has been the presiding narrative of Britain since the Second World War, certainly. And it's brilliantly successful. And Thatcher was pretty unapologetic about it all. She admits herself, I am not loved, but I am respected. And that respect delivered three election wins. Originally, she swept to power with support from across the classes, including the working class. Her brand of aspirational capitalism and nationalism was a potent combination. But for Thatcher, the key was to move up and out of working class life. Here's Mark Garnett again. The damage that was done to community generally, the idea of community was undermined by Thatcher. So it's not just that she gave people a ladder out of what was seen as a dependency culture and all that claptrap. It was more that she pushed people down the pit back into something which actually took away the really, really good and much missed attributes of what you call working class culture, that people actually cared for one another as individuals. Instead, they now resented one another as individuals. And you know who joined Parliament at the same time as Thatcher came to power? Former Labour MP Reg Race. 
a delicious time to become a new MP. <laughs> what was that like at that time? What, what was the atmosphere like? Well, there was enormous shock in the PLP. If you grew up in the 1980s, you might have seen this on the TV. There are nearly five million council tenants in England and Wales, many with families like yours. They go on paying rent every week. But if you've been a council tenant for two years or more, you now have the legal right to buy your house or flat. Right to buy is the policy introduced, first of all, by the Birmingham Tories, taken up and, and extended by Thatcher, which meant that if you were a sitting council house tenant, you could buy your own house, which was fine for you, but not fine for the people coming up behind you. So all these houses and units just disappeared. And of course, what happened was all the best ones were the ones that were sold. And then no more social housing came onto the market. Well, the argument was, oh, we're going to build one to replace every one that was sold off. And it was total nonsense. It's been demonstrated to be utter garbage. And this is why the, the huge issue about the right to buy was critical to the working class being disfranchised. I can remember these conversations from the 79 Parliament. I can remember conversations with Birmingham MPs and the working class, the ones with the good houses, wanted to buy their own houses and they were pressurising their Labour MPs, saying, we want to do this, why are you stopping us? Right, right. Right, and they felt really under pressure about this. I mean, the, the Labour front bench had a serious problem about whether they were going to support it or not, and they fudged it, because they didn't want to oppose people who wanted to buy their own council house and get a nice, cheap house for themselves. And they understood and sort of believed the Thatcher line that a new unit would be built for every single one. People like me never believed a word of it. So, that, I mean, that's, that is a huge predicament, right? Because you're sta- you, you find yourself in a position of standing in the way of aspiration. Yeah. Yes. The right to buy, established in 1980, enabled council tenants to buy their property at a discounted rate. Sounds good, right? It's estimated that 300,000 homes were sold in this way in the first three years alone. Mark Garnett again. I mean, this was blatantly tapping into the kind of constituency of the working class who are now called, you know, the skilled working class, but it's really the aspiring working class. This idea, which is so weirdly British, that owning a home means that you're a person. If you don't own your home, you're not a viable individual. It was a brilliant piece of electioneering and it was in keeping with the Conservative Party's general trajectory from the time it became the rival to Labour. It was the party for the aspiring workers as well as the middle class and it came at a time when the Labour Party's commitment to social housing really was benefiting no one at all. But of course, you know, as we know now, the real crime was preventing local government from investing the receipts from sold council houses in new social housing. It gave millions their own home, but right to buy, or at least the lack of follow through on right to buy, is widely considered to have been one of the central drivers of Britain's current housing crisis. Crucially for our story on the history of class and politics, this kind of thinking of social climbing as the best option for everyone did not die out with the Thatcher era. Margaret Thatcher said that her greatest achievement was Tony Blair. Martin Farr from Newcastle University again. The Thatcher years created a different sort of Labour Party, a Labour Party which necessarily wasn't the party of trade unions to the same extent because there were weaker trade unions and fewer trade unionists. And indeed, arguably, Blair's success was in part in attracting non-traditional voters, non-traditional Labour voters to vote Labour by appealing to the south of England in particular, by not being seen as a threat, by committing to not reversing the Thatcherite trade union laws, for example, by not mentioning class at all, actually, by himself being from a public school and Oxford background and a lawyer. And indeed, there's a guy called John Maples, a Conservative minister. He wrote a memorandum which became leaked called the Maples Memorandum. And he said, Blair is a real and present threat to conservatism. 
and to the Conservative Party because he can reach across to voters in a way that no other Labour leader ever has. And this is quite true. And that's why he was the most successful Labour leader electorally. But in, Labour, in the Labour narrative, he is now something of a villain for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which being, as far as class is concerned, that he was insufficiently concerned with traditional Labour values and traditional Labour policies, and much too concerned with appeasing the traditional enemies of the party who eventually, they would say, consumed him. Blair did, of course, do a lot of good in his time in office too. The difference was, you know, when I was in, in Parliament between 92 and 97, uh, I had constituents of mine in some of the estates here coming to me saying I'm paid £1.50 an hour and uh, my wages are being forced down. When I was in 97, 98, 99, I could vote for a minimum wage to put a basic floor under wages. David Hansen grew up on a council estate in Liverpool. His dad was a coal miner and his mum worked in a biscuit factory. He was active in politics from a young age, becoming first a councillor and eventually a Labour MP in 1992. He was part of the government during the new Labour years. And for him, when Blair came to power in 1997, things changed for the better. The difference the Labour government made was things like the minimum wage, things like Sure Start, things like establishing devolution to give greater powers to local people to make decisions here. You know, those are really important decisions that we made that were different to... You know, the, the time in Parliament, 92 to 97, the local coal mine closed. Minimum wage wasn't in power. Funding was reduced to schools and to hospitals. But that changed with a, a diff, different government. Sure Start was a programme of massive investment in centres where families in poorer areas could go for support to parent their children. Things like helping them learn how to breastfeed or to balance work and childcare. David is now back in a government role, working for Keir Starmer this time from the House of Lords. But before becoming Lord Hanson of Flint, David saw firsthand what kind of impact these political decisions have. And I'm a product of that previous Labour governments, building council houses, investing in the health service, providing stable employment, giving people the opportunity to have decent work and rights at work, giving us a secure home. Ne never take away from the fact, well, we lived in a council house all my life until I was 18 and left. It was never a council house, it was always our home. It was a secure, loving home. But Blair also realised that as working-class voters made up an ever-decreasing portion of the electorate, an ambitious Prime Minister with a mind set on winning elections was going to have to appeal to other voters too. The famous assertion from the period that we're all middle class now was as much an election tactic as an observation of 1990s Britain. It was around this time that Labour, the party set up to represent the working classes, stopped talking about class at all. Instead, the refrain became simply hard-working families. Labour was founded as the party to uphold the interests of working people. And that comes over very much in Starmer's rhetoric. And of course, it's the same old thing, that if you do appeal to working people, and we are agreeing now that working people is really virtually all of us, and not just people who work with their hand, manual workers, it's also clerks and low-paid workers in, in the public sector, you've potentially got that same winning ticket back again. It's this moment that so many people reference as the turning point, when Labour became a party for middle-class people and alienated its traditional base. Tim Bale believes the relationship began to fray thanks to the policies of Labour governments in the 1970s, but Blair's rhetoric was the next step in the breakup between Labour and its working-class base. The decline in class voting after 1997, however, had perhaps a little bit less to do with, if you like, the performance of the government and more to do with the, the rhetoric of the government. Did Blair's idea that we'd all become middle class anyway hold any truth? The 1990s were just the beginning of a period in which the definitions of class shifted along with the changing nature of the British economy in a globalised world. But... As we'll find out next time on Know Your Place, the class structure doesn't let you go that easily. The social mobility is problematic in itself as a concept because it necessarily requires a certain amount of people making it, you know, if you've got the right sort of characteristics and leaving everyone else behind. It doesn't talk about sort of 
create a more egalitarian society. It necessarily entails leaving the class structure intact. That's on the next episode of Know Your Place from the Conversation Documentaries. This podcast was written by me, Laura Hood, and our producer, Anouk Mie. She also mixed the series. Our executive producer is Gemma Ware. If you'd like to get in touch, please email us at podcast at theconversation.com. And do sign up for our Friday afternoon briefing, Politics Weekly, an essential analysis of the biggest stories in British politics to take you into the weekend. Subscribe via the link in our show notes. This series is a production from The Conversation, a not-for-profit news organisation working with academics to share their knowledge with the general public. If you like what we do, please consider donating to The Conversation by going to donate.theconversation.com. Thank you again to the National Centre for Social Research for supporting this series. And thank you for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, check out The Conversation Weekly. It's a show where leading experts around the world connect their research to the biggest trends, ideas and issues of today. I'm the host, Gemma Ware, and each week I get to talk to academics about the fascinating discoveries they're using to make sense of the world around us. We ask questions like, what's going on in our brains when we're in a state of creative flow? The most experienced musicians had a network of brain areas in the left hemisphere that was associated with a high state of flow. We find out what seals are telling us about the melting of Antarctic glaciers. We can get a vertical profile of the water property in every dive that they have. And we find out what happened to Nelson Mandela's South Africa. Our expectations of what could have been done in the past are too high, but then our expectations of what we should be reimagining in the present for the future are too low. Follow The Conversation Weekly for new episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts, or find us on theconversation.com.